Okay, hi. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started here? I got a few people that showed up. Uh, sorry, I continue to have technical difficulties, so I thought it would be best still today to uh, go back to um, a home office. So I'm still working on getting um, those issues worked out in the classroom. So I'll try probably try again on Tuesday. Um, so yeah, I've I've had a couple of questions about the. Um, um, current problem set too that people are working on. So kind of my plan today was to talk about the problem set and then also maybe get started on the programming assignment too as well. Um, and then yeah, I'll post this video for uh, people who are watching these uh, offline or asynchronously if they're looking for some uh, some help on the, the uh, problem set or getting started on the second assignment. Um, so, I mean, I've actually had a couple of people asking about the first problem on the problem set, um, which I don't know. I mean, I, I usually I think the second one's probably the, the one that might take people more time, but um, I'll talk about both of these. Uh, first, first of all, just kind of a general thing, uh, general kind of advice on these. So like the first problem set, you just had to kind of fill in the answers, but uh, a lot of the questions on the problem sets and the tests are meant to be discussion questions. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for more than just a few words or a sentence, right? Um, so, you know, the, the, the first problem here isn't that complex, but, but at least a couple sentences or a paragraph or something that shows me that you understand the problem and you can discuss it and that you can propose a solution uh, that answers the question here that suggests an intermediate policy and that you can support your solution. So you can discuss your solution, how it would work, so I mean that at least ought to be you know a paragraph or something, some some discussion, right? Um, I mean in general for the written question for our class here, you should be giving me some discussion. You should be writing them in full English. Um, you should be able to you know state a hypothesis and support your conclusion with discussion, that kind of stuff, in order to to get full marks on it. So. Uh, we had a couple of discussion questions like that on the first test um, as well. Um, so in particular for, for this question, um, so it, it helps. I, I thought I would talk a little bit. Um, it, it helps that you understand the state transition diagram from our chapter three that you're supposed to be reading for this unit. Uh, so, but in particular, you kind of need to understand the difference between um, a process that's simply blocked versus a process that is suspended or swapped out. So um, I ran across, you know, a lot of students, even, even after looking at um, the materials from this chapter about the, the seven state, seven process states, um, um, have some confusion or, or don't really understand what suspended or swapped out is or, or what the difference is between that and being simply blocked, okay? So, so those are completely different um, states for processes in an operating system. So if, if, if a process is blocked, I mean, that simply means that it's doing something like um, input output, IO, um, and, it's wait, and it needs to wait on some event before it can continue doing its work, right? So, um, uh, but suspending processes, that's something that, that many operating systems do. Um, so it's not as important as it used to be, but, but most operating systems, Windows, Linux, um, uh, Mac OS, uh, they all have process suspension mechanisms uh, in there. Um, and, and that's a function because, because in a lots of operating systems, um, on the system that they're running on, memory is one of the resources that has to be managed. You know, this is something that we've talked about. So the operating system as a resource manager. Um, but memory is often a pretty limiting factor. Um, there's not enough of it, so, so you always need more. Um, and sometimes it can be so scarce that uh, the operating system just can't make any progress. It's got too many, too many processes currently running in the system, and, and it can't make any progress on those because it can't get enough memory to any of them to do the work they need to do, okay? So in that case, um, operating systems have this mechanism called suspending processes, right? 
So typically what that involves is selecting a process to be completely removed from memory. So deallocating all the memory that was, that was assigned or given to that process um, and uh, um, um, completely freeing up its memory resources so that it, those resources can be given to other processes to continue working, right? So that process isn't done yet, but we've suspended it. We've kicked it out of main memory to free up uh, main memory for some resources, all right? But that's really what process suspension is. Okay. So for our second program assignment, we actually don't do anything with process suspension. But um, in this question, you know, it kind of helps to understand that. So, so, so the issue here is that um, if we have a scheduler that's a priority-based scheduler, um, so normally a priority-based scheduler would always schedule the process with the highest priority. So if I have a couple of processes in the system um, that are ready to run. Um, and a process can be suspended out of memory, but but currently ready to run. So that's one of the seven states in our uh, process state transition diagram from chapter three, figure 3.9, right? So if, if, if the highest process that's ready to run is actually suspended out, there's a bit of a quandary for the operating system because um, it's, it's expensive to swap the process back in. So to swap the process back in, to, to let it be the running process, uh, we have to reallocate some memory for it. Um, and then, you know, it being swapped out means that it's on secondary storage. So that means it's probably out on hard drive somewhere. So we need to reload the program code and data back into the memory after we allocate it some new memory to run, right? So that, that's, that's all what needs to be done to unsuspend a process, right? So if I, if I select that process because it's the highest priority process, um, it's gonna take some time before it's ready to actually start running, right? So, so yeah, this question asks you, you, I mean, you need to come up with something that's kind of intermediate to these two extremes. So you know, we could have a, a schedule that just remains completely um, highest priority based. So even if the highest priority is, is ready suspended, um, it would just go ahead and choose that always. Uh, even though that's expensive or the other extreme is always ignore ready suspended processes so, so leave some other mechanism to to uh, unsuspend those processes and bring them back in and, and only select from the highest priority they're in a ready state not in a ready suspended state all right last question one um so like I said, I have some questions about that. So hopefully that, that helps. For those people that are here, let me know if, um, if you have questions about that or anything else. So, so these are meant to be more discussion kinds of things. So I, I try to do these based on questions I'm getting, hearing from people and stuff. So. Um, so yeah, the second question, um, you really, um, need to read the the chapter four on threads as well before you do the second question so you know the the, the problem sets really are meant to be for both you know all the materials that we're going to be reading even though um so I, I maybe should change my um description of the units a little bit because i usually kind of say the first chapter in the first week of the unit and then the um the um uh, the second chapter but but yeah you really need to read both the chapter three on processes and the chapter four on threads. Um, uh, oops, sorry, um, to um, get going here. So, so it, it'll, it'll help to understand threads. So this is an example of a threaded program. So, so we're actually using threads. So I, I thought I'd describe this just a little bit. Um, and again, for this though, you know, uh, my, my general advice, I mean, I am looking for more than than just a very simple description. So in, in particular, there, there's like what four or five questions, four questions here. I mean, you ought to explicitly give me the answer to each of these. Yeah. So there's more than four. Each one of these asks sometimes asks more than one question. So, so you ought to be going through and trying to give me an explicit answer, at least a sentence or two on each one of these questions that's asked on, on the question, like the first part um, and the second part. So so this is an example of a threaded program. So if, if you've never run across this before, what, what's happening here is uh, this, this program, as you can see, this is actually a, an actual real program that'll run. It's using a threading library called pthreads. 
um, that's available. Um, um, well, it's, it's actually a general thing because you can actually get P threads on Windows as well, but um, it was originally uh, a Unix thing, so a POSIX uh, standard. Um, so normally when you run a program, um, as our textbook discusses in chapter four on threading, um, it'll start up as it'll start up as a process. It'll start up the process uh, with a single thread associated with that process. So that that's the default for a operating system that supports threading and multi-threading. So the build multi-threading is the ability for a process to actually have more than one thread of execution within the context of that process. Okay. So, and this is discussed in chapter four, uh, when you have multiple threads running in the context of a process, um, uh, each thread is a separate thread of execution, but they all share memory, okay? So they all share the, the, the process context, uh, including uh, the, 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 the memory that's allocated for that process, right? So the way that that kind of happens in this example explicitly is that we've got like a, a, a global variable called my global and, and all the threads that run in this example um, um, program here um, can access and read and write uh, and see that my global variable, all right? So the way this works, I mean, you really don't have to understand the details that much, but, but I mean, hopefully it's somewhat understandable if you, if you look through here. So, so uh, p thread create um, and um, p thread join come from this POSIX thread library. So we were able to use that by including the pthread.h header file here. pthread create actually creates a new thread. Okay, so initially when um, the operating system runs this program, it creates one thread and that thread starts running um, in the main uh, function here, right? So that's kind of, that's the way C programs work is, is the first line of code and the main function is the first instruction that's going to be executed when that process starts running, right? That's kind of what's special about main. Um, so anyway, by calling pthread, we actually end up having hooks into the operating system. So a second thread is created within the um, context of this process that we're running. Okay? So, so the, the, the first thread will keep running after this call to pthread create, it'll keep running in main. So, so the first original thread will, will will go after the if statement and we'll actually run this for loop here. But the new thread that's created uh, will, will be running in the second thread and it's gonna be running the code um, in the function that's given as the um, fourth parameter here, okay? Um, and yeah, you don't, it, it's, you don't really have to understand any, any of the other parameters here. I might've might described them a little bit here, but. But yeah, the important one is this one. So we're actually passing in the, the name of the function um, as a parameter, and that is the code that's going to be run in the second thread that's created by the, uh, the p thread create function there. So, so after this function returns, we've got one thread that's going to be running this loop here in the main, and we've got another thread that's going to be running this loop here um, in thread function, and they're going to be running them, um, you know, so, so um, in a multi-threaded operating system, as, as is discussed in chapters three and four, um, it's going to be running these using multi-programming, right? So um, the operating system can switch between these. So it could be running this thread for a bit, and then switch over and run this thread for a bit, right? And if we have multiple CPUs, I mean, it could actually even do true parallelism. So it could be that one thread is running on one CPU or one CPU core at the same time, and the other thread within the same program is running on a different CPU or different core, right? But either way, you get the same effect. So whether it's one CPU and, and it's the operating system is switching between them using multi-programming, or it's multiple CPUs um, and uh, we're, we're getting true parallelism, so they're actually at executing uh, truly simultaneously on two different cores. Um, uh, in either case, the, the effect is the same. So uh, we might get some interleaving of this code, as is discussed in our chapter three and four here. So. Um, so the main difficulty, the main thing to understand is that they're both uh, using and manipulating this my global variable, okay? So, so the thing I'm looking for from here is for you to describe what's happening um, and, and why it's an issue um, 
things like that. So uh, another thing here, I mean, I, I sometimes get people that think, and so I'm just going to give this to you, people that think that it's an issue that we don't see exact interleaving of the two threads here. Okay, so, so the dots and the O's are coming because we print out an O from the thread running in the main function, uh, and we print out a dot from the thread running in thread function here, right? So you can, you can kind of see how the interleaving is happening, right? And some people think it's a, it's an issue um, that, that we should expect to see exact interleaving. So a dot followed by an O followed by a dot followed by an O always, okay? But that's not actually correct, okay? Because um, um, the operating system scheduling and switching between these two threads, um, um, there's nothing that guarantees that it will always um, pause one thread and switch to the other and then run that thread at least past that point of printing out and pause and switch back to the other one okay so there's some things in there that, that make it likely that it will interleave but but nothing that will guarantee that will only run one loop or one cycle before interleaving and switching over to the other thread all right so that's that's not the unexpected thing here potentially um, in this output. All right, uh, questions from the, those that are here? Anybody want to ask anything about the problem set? Let's see here, hopefully I turned on my recording. Um, yeah, okay. Um, all right, so um, if there's no questions about the problem set, I, I thought I would get started on the second program assignment as well, talk a little bit about that, maybe not too much, uh, we can get into it in more detail, although again, I encourage people, you know, don't, you know, don't wait until this time next week, um, start on the programming assignment, this one will be, will take more time than the first one uh, for most people. Um, so um, you should start on it, um, and, you know, at least as soon as you get done with the second problem set, you know, so like this weekend or, or at least by before Monday or so. Um, um, So, oh, um, so yeah, let me go ahead and just um, let me go ahead and get my dev box started up and running here. Um, So um, I've got mine in my boxes directory, but you might have yours in a different directory. But um, you know, as usual, just as a reminder, when you're starting up your dev box, you should always use the vagrant from the command line, start it up and, and uh, halt it, bring it back down. So to boot it up with vagrant up um, and bring it down with the vagrant um, halt. Um, and you know, look for that your port is being forwarded, so that's the port that your Visual Studio Code server should show up on 8080. Um, and for this class, it's important that um, your guest editions are up and that you're correctly seeing the folder being mounted or else when you're ready to make your submission file and submit it, um, you won't have an easy way to get it out of your virtual dev box um, and uh, upload it to, um, um, to B2L. So. Um, so if that's running, um, should be, oops, wrong port number there. Be able to connect to it on port 8080. Uh, I still got assignment one up here. So another thing, if I haven't mentioned it before or emphasized it, um, you should always open the, the correct folder. So I'm gonna close this folder. So if I wanna work on assignment two, I should be opening up 
the uh, assignment to folder. So you can do, you know, file open folder, um, or if you've got the file explorer here, but no folder open, you can just click the open folder button um, and you have to find that particular assignment. So you want to, um, um, so, so don't open up like at the top level for all the assignments to get the, the build system and stuff to work. You have to open up the actual assignment uh, because that's where the, um, so the, the setup for the VS code. So this is .VS code directory in here that, that has the configuration uh, to set up the build system um, and other stuff. So, so you have to open up the folder that has the .VS code directory so that we get um, uh, IntelliSense working and we get the uh, uh, code formatters and things working. Um, and we get the build system and everything else, all right? Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, you know, as usual, you can open up the markdown file um, from within Visual Studio Code. Um, you can even uh, render it, like um, right click on there and open preview or control shift V, uh, or you can open the PDF on your um, on your system. I'll just do it from inside Visual Studio Code today here. Look at the assignment description. So in this, this assignment, we're really um, concentrating on the three main states of the uh, um, um, process state model that's introduced uh, and discussed in chapter three. So, so basically that ready running blocked um, set of states. So, so those define kind of the main things that, that most operating systems um, um, have uh, in order to you know keep track of, of which processes are, are ready to run, which processes aren't ready to run because they're waiting on some I/O, uh, which is the actual process or processes that are currently running. All right. Um, so these states will be called different things in different operating systems, but um, 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 but but all operating systems will usually have things that correspond to these, right? So, um, so in this assignment, we're going to be simulating managing a set of processes. So um, as, as is kind of um, described at the beginning here, um, I mean, you're basically going to have to create something like a process control block. So something um, that um, keeps track of all the processes that are currently running in the system. Uh, and then you're also gonna have to add functionality to uh, move them through the different states, right? So to dispatch a process. So when the CPU becomes idle, you have to have a ready queue somewhere in, in your system. So you can find the process that's at the front of the ready queue and, and make it become the, the current running process. Um, when simulated I.O. events occur, you have to, to uh, make the current running process go into a blocked state. Um, and you may or may not need a separate um, data structure, a list or something maybe um, to keep track of all the processes that are currently blocked. And you have to be able to unblock those. Uh, we are um, using round robin um, dispatching and, and time slicing in here. So um, uh, we're also simulating that um, a process that's scheduled to run on the CPU, um, uh, the, the system will have some idea of the time slice quantum. So some amount of time that a process runs. And if it, if it runs for that amount of time, so if it meets or exceeds its time slice quantum, um, it will be timed out. So in that case, you know, it doesn't get blocked waiting on I.O. Um, it gets just returned back to the end of the ready queue um, so that we can do time slicing, so, so that we can uh, select another process to be dispatched and run for a bit, all right? Those are all stuff that we've described in chapter three about, you know, um, why we've got these sort of process states um, and, and kind of what they work and what we mean by dispatching and timeout and blocking and unblocking and those kinds of things. So, um, so 
So the, the simulation here, so, so again, like the first assignment, you're basically, I think everything, all, your, all the code you add is gonna be in process simulator.cpp. Um, although um, in this assignment, you are gonna have to add some, um, oops, you're gonna have to add some, um, um, some uh, data types in order to implement like a ready queue and a process control block and some things like that. So um, just saying, I need to do something here. So um, back to the initial state. Um, actually better. Um, so, as I was saying, so so unlike on the first assignment, you're probably also going to have to make some modifications in the header file as well to add in some private member variables for like your ready queue um, and uh, your process control block, uh, maybe some other things. So, so like maybe a, a list of block processes, depending on how you decide to implement it. So, uh, don't forget to change your uh, author field. If you're working in, in a group, make certain that um, you list all group members alphabetically here. So um, So it's best to list those alphabetically by last name so that the grading system correctly um, figures out all the group members for your submission, right? Uh, another thing, I mean, you know, people seem to be a bit cavalier about save, uh, sharing their uh, campus-wide IDs with people, you know, so if you are in a group, um, um, you probably really shouldn't give me your CW IDs um, where your other group members can see those, so um, anyway. So it's fine not to provide those. Actually, it's fine not to provide those even if you're working as an individual. So I kind of just had that in there as so a double check. But um, um, but but yeah, especially since we got group teams in here, you can. Um, um, anyway, so let's let's get back to talking about this. So um, so the the um, Simulations take the form of just a, a file of events that occur um, when we're simulating processes being created. So again, you can find those in the sim files uh, that we use for all the testing, uh, the unit tests and the system tests. So like, uh, it should be exactly the same as this one. Um, so things like, uh, so, so new means well, whenever a new occurs, a, a new process needs to be created um, in the system. So you have to add in some functionality to create a new process and add it to your equivalent of the process control block or some data structure where you keep track of all your processes. Um, whenever uh, a CPU occurs, that means that we need to simulate a CPU cycle happening. So that, that's one of the more complex ones. So basically, uh, kind of like I described, so there's a couple of things that have to happen for each CPU cycle. So if the CPU is currently idle, we have to do the dispatching function to select a process from the front of the ready queue to make it the running process. Um, and then if there is a process running, we need to simulate it running for one CPU time step. Um, so basically we need to keep track of how many cycles it's run in its current time, time quantum so that we can check whether it has uh, exceeded the, the system time slice quantum. Um, and then again, at the end of the CPU cycle, if it has, so, so if the time slice quantum is five and, and the current running process has just run its fifth 
So the PU cycle, we need to time the process out, um, which means that you need to go back to a ready state and, and be put back to the end of the ready queue um, in that case. Right? Um, so then besides new, pro new processes being created, CPU cycles um, uh, done simulates a, the, the whatever the current running process is. Another way it can stop being the running process. Um, so a running process can either time out, in which case it goes back to the ready queue, um, becomes, goes back to a ready state. It can be blocked um, if it's waiting on IO, in which case it goes to a blocked state, or it could exit. So it, it could actually be done um, um, executing as code. So, so the done is supposed to simulate the process finishing off and exiting the system. So whenever those happen, we need to put the current running process into a done state um, and remove it from the CPU. So, and then block and unblock are, you know, so whatever the current running process is, if a block happens, that means that that running process uh, is, is gonna be become blocked waiting on some IO. So it should be put in a block state and, and maybe added onto some list of block processes so that when the corresponding unblock event occurs for some event ID, we can search for the currently blocked processes and unblock the process that was waiting on that um, event ID. So the second number for the block and unblock is just some generic integer, but it's supposed to represent an event ID, right? So if, if, if a process blocks on event ID 83, you can think of that as maybe it's waiting on this hard drive two for a read. Maybe that's what event ID 83 is, right? And then if we get the corresponding unblock for event ID 83, that means that that read on hard drive three was finished. So, so anything that was waiting, so, so the process that was waiting on that read to finish should become unblocked and put back to the ready queue. Um, so um, let me talk a little bit about the classes and then kind of like I did for the first one, maybe I'll get you guys started. Um, although today I'm not gonna go too far. Um, um, I'll just talk about the first task here and I'll leave talking about more stuff until next, uh, next Tuesday or so when I suspect more people will be uh, more into uh, getting started on the second uh, programming assignment here. Um, all right, so um, and I usually find it helpful to describe um, some of the code uh, here, so, so what's in here. So, um, there's actually, besides the process simula simulator, there's actually also a process.cpp and a process.hpp. Um, and, and a process state.cpp and a process uh, state.hpp. Um, so those are, you need to use those. Um, um, so you don't have to define your own process object, nor do you have to define the process states. Uh, th those are defined um, for you, but you won't have to make any modifications in the code of the process or the process state. Um, classes here. So, so you know, um, um, like we did for the first assignment, there's also a process simulator. That's where you're going to be making all your changes. So this is the one that actually um, implements the simulation of this uh, three, um, you know, process state diagram um, and um, managing processes and moving them between those three states based on a set of simulated events here. Um, and you're going to be implementing um, the, the, the code for many of these methods for the process simulator. Um, so um, including, you know, the, the basic ones for um, the, the, the new dispatch, um, CPU event timeout, block and unblock. So these are the things that get called whenever um, and, and done. So, so these are the, the, the methods that get called whenever um, the corresponding event happens as we're running through the simulation here. So, um, so, 
So yeah, let's look at, um, um, so you should be using um, like the, um, uh, the processes that are defined in the process.hpp. So you don't, don't have to create your own uh, instance of a process or your own process object. Um, so, so we'll be using these and these are already hooked into the simulator. So, so you, you have to use these, okay? So, so the process um, is just a minimal thing um, in order to represent a process for our simulation. So it keeps track of um, um, its unique ID. So somewhere it has to have, every time a new process is created, we have to assign it the next process identifier. So that's just a, um, an integer. Um, so notice that the type is PID, but um, we're just using type def to try to make the code more readable. So, so uh, um, uh, the, the PID type is really just an unsigned integer um, in our simulation, as is the time and the event ID. So if you don't know what type def is in C, you can think of that as just like an alias, right? So we'll, we'll, instead of having kind of unsigned int, which doesn't give you um, a hint or an idea of, of how that particular data type might be being used, we give it a particular name. So any place that's supposed to be one of those event IDs for blocking and unblocking, um, we, we, we use event ID as the type name instead of just the more generic unsigned int. Um, and so on. Um, so a process um, um, is, is assigned a unique identifier, which is really just an integer number starting at one. Um, and we keep track of, of the time that it started, um, the total time it used. We also need to keep track of the quantum it's used in, in its current time slice quantum. So this is where we need to hook into um, 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 the the, um, the the round robin scheduler um, kind of hooks into here to, to keep track of how many quantum it's used uh, and whether it needs to be timed out or not, um, as an example. So. Um, And then most of the stuff when you're managing processes, you're going to be do these do this by creating a, a process and then so, so creating a process using one of the constructors and then um, calling functions on the process. So so things like you know if, if the process needs to be dispatched, you have to figure out which particular process in your system we're dispatching and then call the dispatch um, on that process. Um, and then the final thing, you know, so, so also we've defined a set of process states already. Um, those are in the process state.hpp file. Um, so this is actually just a simple enumerated type. Um, so, you know, for this simulation, um, um, I mean, I, I mainly think of it as, as we're, we're kind of simulating the, the three main process states, ready, ready, and block, but um, um, we do also define new and done. So that those can be used if needed, especially done because yeah. So if if when processes are finished, uh, we do need to do something to to make certain that it doesn't get put back on the ready queue. Um, so we should mark it as done at that point. Um, All right, so we can come back to these, but, but be aware of those. So you'll be using the processes and the process states uh, when you're doing things in here. Um, so the, the first task um, is meant to be a little bit of warm up. So, so I'm, I mean, you know, I ask you to actually implement some of these getter functions. Okay, most of these, not all of these, but most of these, uh, there's a corresponding um, um, member variable for our process simulator class. So, so the getter for those should just need just needs to return the um, uh, corresponding member variable of the process simulator, right? So. Um, Let's open up the tests here. All 
Um, so I didn't show. So, um, I mean, as usual, um, I should have, after I opened up my um, um, folder here, uh, I probably should have tested to make certain that everything was building and running before I begin uh, actually working on the code. So I'll try that now. So I'll do a control shift one, should do a clean, clean up everything. Um, control shift uh, two should then do make all. Again, this you know depends that you've got the right folder open um, and that you've got your um, IntelliSense um, extension installed correctly. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, it should be it. So, um, and if everything builds, we should be able to run the tests. Um, so they'll run, but um, our first failing test will be um, the one on line 145 here. So yeah, all these things in the first test case um, are testing out um, um, some stuff that you don't have to implement. So really not until um, we get to the second test case, uh, does that actually apply to the first task here, right? So, um, in this case, we're creating an instance of a process simulator. The process simulator takes one parameter in the constructor, which is the, the time slice quantum. So we can actually run simulations with different time slice quantum. So, so here we're specifying that, that five CPU cycles uh, represents the um, allotted time slice quantum. And whenever a process runs for five consecutive cycles, it should be timed out um, and, and returned back to the ready queue. Right? So, um, You can see that if you look at the constructor for the process simulator, that that's the, the um, parameter that it uses when you, whenever you create a new uh, a process simulator class here. So um, let me open up the CPP file as well. So yeah, let's go to that constructor. Um, oh, I guess actually you do have to implement that in task one. So um, forgot about that. Hopefully that's described in here. So uh, oh um, yeah, so you will need to initialize member variables in the constructor, like the time slice quantum. Uh, the system time, next process ID, et cetera. So let's, uh, let me just pick one of those. Well, um, um, so like the time slice quantum, um, that should be, uh, so, so all, most all of these, not, not all of these, but, but most of these um, are already defined as member variables for the process simulator. So um, um, for example, we can initialize the time slice quantum, um, To the one that's given here. So again, you know, I think I discussed this last time for assignment one. Um, we're using a parameter name here that's the same as the um, uh, member variable name. Um, so to disambiguate, we'll use the the this pointer to um, say that that I want to explicitly assign the member variable name called time slash quantum to be the value, whatever we pass into the constructor here for the parameter. So, um, right. And just as another example, so we could initialize the, the next process ID. So we need to keep track of in our simulator what the next unique PID is um, that's going to be assigned for the next new process. Right? So we, we put that into the next process ID here. Right? Um, um, oh, um, oh yeah. So um, so the first two things we're testing is that um, you know if if we create a simulation with a time slash quantum of five, if we call the getter method, um, it should um, Say that the time slice quantum um, for the system is set to five. Right? Well, likewise, um, 
you know, when we construct um, a new process simulator, the, the next process ID should start off as one. So we just initialize both of those here. Uh, we might have to um, also uh, make certain that the, um, the getter methods are working. So these are just stubbed out right now, but um, in this case, um, uh, we've got member variables for these. So um, we just return the, the, the uh, process simulator's time slice quantum. So here there's no, um, you know, there's no conflict or ambiguity since, since I have no local variable or parameter with that name. It's going to assume that well, I must mean then the time slice quantum from the process simulator class itself. Right? So, so we can just access that. Um, and the next process ID, right? And that, that's what the main thing is for this task one here. So um, by modifying those, we ought to pass these first two tests then now. So we'll rebuild. Um, so it's always good to, to do things incrementally. So don't make more. So, you know, I encourage you not even to do like I just did here. I actually fixed two functions here, but yeah, do them one at a time. So, so get one function code in there, make sure it compiles and still runs and still passes the test that it was passing before. You haven't broken anything. Um, But in this case, unless I broke something, we should be getting past um, uh, 145, 146. And then the first one that's failing is you now the, the system time. So we have to initialize those. Um, get the rest of these uh, going here. For the first half, I guess. Um, some of these, um, uh, we didn't give member variable, variables for because you might, depending on how you implement like your ready queue um, and your block queue and things, you might. Uh, do these in different ways. Okay, so anything that's not given a member variable here for this task one um, in process simulator.h, we've also got like system time, um, number of finished processes, um, but um, so you ought to be able to get system time and the number of finished processes, but we don't have like a number of active processes, um, nor do we have like a um, uh, Ready queue size, ready queue front, ready, ready queue back, uh, block list size. So uh, at least for task one, um, you can just go ahead and hard code the expected return value. So put in a stub function for now for anything um, that we don't have a um, um, that, that you weren't kind of given an initial member variable for because you, you weren't given those for a reason because it, it, it will depend on kind of how you implement like your ready queue and maybe other data structures on, on uh, how you might get that information to return from a getter function. So for example, um, get number of active processes, um, You might just for now stub that out, um, or actually it is already returning zero. So some of these are already returning the right thing to actually pass these tests. Um, but like um, ready to choose front, maybe. Uh, I guess it is. So, so yeah, most if, if the things are already passing, you can probably go ahead on to the next. Um, um, the next task here. So. Um, 
So the next, next task is about implementing the new event. So, so let me just say a quick thing about that, and then I think I'm going to um, stop for today and, and leave kind of details on that. But, but yeah, for the next task, um, um, we're, we're starting with the simulation. So the first thing you have to do is be able to handle the creation of new processes, okay? So the new event occurs when a new process is being started up and added to the operating system, right? Um, so, so really to implement this, you have to make a decision on how you're going to manage processes. So you, so you have to have something like a, um, um, a process control block or some sort of a mechanism so that when you create a new process, uh, you can remember it um, so that um, you can get information um, uh, about the process and things. Like, like, for example, I need to be able to later on ask to get a process with a particular process ID and you need to be able to return that process. So the only way to do that is if you save it in like a, a list or a, an array or something like that, right? Um, So I usually, I mean, you know, I, I, I usually kind of make this explicit. So when a new event occurs, I mean, somehow you have to be creating a new process. And, and that's, that is the, um, um, you know, you need to be creating a new one of these from the, the process.hpp file, right? Um, in particular, you know, the, the creating a new process, uh, uh, it only has, well, it does have a default constructor, but you want to use this constructor. So you want to um, figure out, you know, you want to assign it a process identifier and you want to make certain that you record the time, the system time that it was starting, right? Um, so, you know, Couple. Of, I mean, you could create this dynamically or statically. Um, I'll just create it um, um, statically here, uh, just as an example, where I pass in um, the uh, the information that we need. So we need to assign it a process identifier. Um, We need to pass in the, uh, the the current system time, right? So these are coming from our process simulator itself. So we, we the process simulator keeps track of what the next process ID should be and what the system time is. Okay, the next process ID should be incremented because we just assign a new process um, the the process ID like one if if this was the very first process, right? So we need to to be certain that. the next time a new process is created, that it gets assigned the next process identifier. So um, this is the place where the, the next process identifier has to be incremented, right? Um, the system time should be getting incremented in the CPU um, um, event. So whenever CPU cycles occur, the system time is simulated by uh, uh, being incremented by one. So that's where the, the current system time would be being paid. Um, but um, yeah, so, so for example, by incrementing the next process ID, that should actually allow you to pass this test after we call sim new event. Uh, but um, you know, so, so you'll need to do something to implement the get number of active processes. Um, so now should be returning one where it was uh, where we had hard coded it turn zero before, and that will depend on um, how you keep track of that information. So, I mean, you could add like a, a member variable called number of active processes and just increment that, right? Um, but, um, you know, um, like for example, for here though, you need to return this actual process that we just created here. So to be able to do that, to be able to create, to return that in the get process um, member function here, um, you're going to have to have something like an array or a list. Um, um, so, so you, know, you know, I would recommend using like a standard template. You know, learn the standard template library. I've got some, I've got some videos about using uh, standard template library containers like uh, lists and, and vectors. And I mean, definitely, you probably want you need to learn that because you really want to use like a, a queue 
um, for the ready queue. Uh, you know, don't don't try and implement your a queue yourself. Um, you know, to push things onto the back and pop things from the front, or you know, in queue things on the back and uh, in queue things from the front and that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, but anyway, for the process control block, you know, I need to have some way that you know if, if we ask for the process to return the process with the process identifier one, it returns that process that we just created. So, And really, like a list, uh, a standard type of library list or something like that would be better. But, um, you know, kind of just as a hint, I mean, you could possibly just use uh, a regular array. Um, and in this case, you know, if, if you're allocating an array statically here, you have to say what the maximum number of processes are that I can have in my process control block. Um, and I'll allow you to statically allocate that, in which case it would probably be better to um, add like a constant. Um, you know, like a global. But again, you know, that'd be another advantage of using something a little bit higher level, like a standard template library list. So you wouldn't have to worry about having um, some maximum size for your process table or your process control block. So. Right. So, but I'm, so I'm just doing this mainly as an illustration. So if you define something like that, uh, I mean, you could potentially, for example, um, It into your process table. And here I'm going to ignore index zero because our, our process ID start at index one in the simulation. So, so we ignore um, uh, index zero um, and we put this, you know, so if the first process that's created would have a, a process ID of one uh, and I haven't incremented it yet. So I just um, assign that new process into my process table. So once you've done that, now you know process table is a member variable of my process simulator. So I could potentially pull this back out by the process ID um, in the, um, uh, the the get process member function uh, here. So, right. so so yeah, this is kind of a, a stub implementation. So you need to, to change this, fix the thing to return the actual process. Um, um all right so yeah i think that's um that's um kind of it for here so somebody asked about the task one solution again so um so for task one um, um it's, it's meant to be kind of warm up um where did my description go right. um so for task one you mainly have to get these getters and setters to be working so the main thing you have to do is correctly initialize these in the um, constructor. So, um, so for the process simulator, you might have to initialize the time slice quantum, the next process ID, maybe some other things as well, right? Um, definitely anything that's a member variable, you probably want to make certain you initialize it in the constructor, right? And then. Um, for some of these, not all of these, but for some of these, then you want to modify the um, the getter method to be returning the correct member variable, right? So, so when you're initially giving these, they're they're all returning just a hard coded value like zero or something. So um, if we look at um, um, if time slice quantum, um, it was returning zero. So instead, for it to actually pass the tests, if we initialize the process simulator with a time slice quantum of five. 
We set the member variable in the constructor for the time slash quantum to five. Um, and then for the getter method, we return whatever the current value is of our member variable so that we pass that test uh, for the, the get time slash quantum. Same for next process ID and um, the other stuff. So. All right. Okay, um, other questions? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the video here so I can get this um, uh, posted for anybody that's doing these um, asynchronously offline, uh, but I'll stick around um, for, uh, for a bit here, see if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, not uh, um, um, officially on the record here. So, all right, so keep sending questions by email or let me know if you have other questions or, or um, need a meeting or something. Um, and yeah, I'll see you guys later then.